Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where first off, later today, I hope you'll join me at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over at Al Roker's Facebook page. The link is down below in the video description, where we will be going beyond the trailer for his new movie, Morning Show Mystery, Mortal Mishaps, airing on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries, this Sunday night. Now, I'll be interviewing Al, but you'll get to ask him some questions as well, as we'll be taking questions from viewers towards the end of the segment. Again, this all goes down today live at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I think they're going to upload it afterwards, you know, keep it evergreen. So if they do, I'll put a link to it if, in case you can't join us live. But if you can, I hope you will. Again, at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Al Roker's Facebook page. And the link again is down below in the video description. All right, so today's morning movie news, we've got two stories and a viewer question, a, one of your questions right now. Uh, but the two, the two stories have to focus on writing gigs. And the first one is particularly gossipy. It's as interesting, you know, it's great to see Toy Story 4 continue to move forward, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes here, and it's another great look at the politics of Tinseltown. All right, so as you might recall, Toy Story 4 recently lost its writers, Will McCormick and Rashida Jones, who left under not the greatest of circumstances. Uh, so, of course, as you might recall, this all happened around the John Lasseter situation, you know, where he was accused of sexual harassment. It started out that he was giving out too many hugs, right? Uh, but then it became obvious that it was a little bit more than that. He, of course, has taken a leave of absence. So everybody was like, oh no, he hugged Rashida Jones away. And Rashida Jones was like, that's not true. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the fact that women and people of color do not have an equal creative voice at Pixar. That's actually what she said. <laughs> that's so bad. That's so bad. Disney is having a rough time as of late, right? Uh, Star Wars, of course, is being criticized, uh, you know, at the level of the DCEU, as we've been discussing. And then there's this. This is such a serious allegation. And it's right up the alley of social media. I'm surprised that it didn't really take hold. Disney dodged a bullet there. Maybe it'll rear its ugly head later. Who knows? Um, maybe it speaks to who Pixar fans are. I don't know. I know a lot of women like Pixar, um, but nobody seemed too upset about this. I guess we were all just still reeling from the John Lasseter uh, relevant uh, um, uh, reveal. I mean, I, I think someone just should have said to him, you know, it seems that no one tried to contain him, uh, but that's a whole different conversation, which we've had. So anyway, looks like they're giving a, at least another woman a shot on Toy Story 4 as they've hired Stephanie Folsom to take over scripting duties. Uh, now, Stephanie Folsom is her own interesting story because uh, she was denied a story credit, uh, a writing credit on Thor Ragnarok, and boy was she upset about it. She made a big stink about it in the press. And I was like, whoa, Stephanie Folsom, you're not gonna get the credit. Don't end your career before it begins. You know, Hollywood's a small town and you know nobody likes someone who's you know not a team player. I mean, it's, that's the difficulty of working, I think, in any business, actually. You want to be able to fight for what you think you, you're owed, but you don't want to seem like you're not a team player. And um, that's a very fine line to walk, uh, as I'm sure everybody has experienced. Uh, and if not, maybe that's the answer to some of your problems. All right, so anyway, Stephanie Folsom, though, she's working again, and for Disney, no less, right? I'm thinking that maybe Disney's like, we need a woman, and this will shut this woman up from complaining. So two birds with one stone, right? And she, we, she's very outspoken, so I'm sure we can get her out there saying how great it was working at Pixar and how they really cared about my female voice. So we'll see. Uh, she did write a cool blacklist script about Stanley Kubrick faking the moon landing. That's how she kind of got into Tinseltown. Uh, and let's see if she survives the experience. Uh, so I think that's a fascinating story. I didn't like Toy Story 3, so I'm not too into the whole... I mean, I loved Ken. I thought Ken was hilarious. Ken and Barbie. Why don't they have their own movie? I know there was talk of doing it for a little bit, uh, but they were just... Michael Keaton as Ken was just a revelation. But... Um, I really had a lot of problems. I thought Toy Story 3 just went off, off the deep end or into the incinerator when it comes to, you know, making you cry in a, in a, in a pulling your strings kind of way. Uh, you know, just very emotionally manipulative, but a lot of people liked it. And so uh, we'll see if the, if the franchise can continue effectively. All right, so speaking of Disney, boy, they're busy over there. They're moving ahead with a new Oliver Twist with Ice Cube as Fagin. This is a really good idea. I love this idea. Oliver Twist is a fabulous musical. And, you know, for a while there, everybody was really into Annie, you know, the hip-hop community. They had that great remix of It's a Hard Knock Life, and then they remade Annie with Jamie Foxx, but they really, really, like, you know, diluted, I think, what could have been a more powerful film, right? Talking about who is reflected in, you know, these communities today, you know, with who, who's in there and how this, 
how would that change the story? So Oliver Twist, of course, uh, for the, you know what? You should really watch Oliver Twist. It's really good. Uh, there's the, obviously, of course, the David Lean movie, which I would recommend. Uh, but there's also, I don't think Tim Curry's in that one. Uh, he, there's like a TV movie that I think that he was in. But anyway, just pick a version of Oliver Twist. Uh, of course, there's the Disney animated one, which is also Oliver and Company, which also I have to say is very good. One of the la you know, um, it was right before the Disney Renaissance with like the Little Mermaid and everything, but it, it's very good. Uh, it's like in that weird spot in Disney animation with like with Robin Hood and, and those types of movies. Uh, but it has mu music by Billy Joel, and so the music alone is worth watching. But familiarize yourself with the story, and as you do, you'll be like, wow, this is a great idea for having Ice Cube as Fagin. So they, they've hired uh, a writer and they have a director attached. So uh, the writer is Danny Strong. He's also an actor, uh, and he's also, but he, he's, he's actually more successful as a writer. He writes on Empire on Fox, uh, along with Lee Daniels. He's worked a lot with Lee Daniels. And then also he's helped script the Hunger Games movies, which I thought for the most part were pretty good. Uh, and so he's gonna script, and Thomas Kale will direct, who directed Hamilton, uh, but also, uh, he directed Grease Live, which is the best live network show uh, that I've seen. I thought, you know, Peter Pan had its moments, but Grease Live was really well done. It was exciting to watch. Uh, no one has topped it since either, I feel. Now, of course, it's interesting that you have two white filmmakers here, you know, Danny Strong and Thomas Kale, but both of them have a great track record of telling celebrated stories about people of color that have been very well accepted uh, and, and again, celebrated by audiences of color. You know, of course, I'm speaking about Empire and Hamilton. Uh, and everybody likes, uh, you know, Empire, I think, is a little more niche, but of course, everyone's gone crazy over Hamilton, uh, which I think, you know, was very smart in the way it, you know, talked about immigrants, you know, with the beginning of this country and the Im immigrant situation today. That's really, really clever stuff. That's, I think, the undercurrent of Hamilton. That's just brilliant. Uh, so I think doing Oliver Twist with Ice Cube is great, and I think that this creative team that they've assembled is fabulous. And I'm curious how you feel about it. All right, so the viewer question is perfect timing, because uh, uh, Magid Mahood wanted to ask it about The Greatest Showman, but there's another show that I think I want to bring into this conversation. So Magid Mahood, uh, viewer question, wrote me and said, so Grace, why do movies that talk about historical people and events, you know, character, etc., or time, uh, and the movie doesn't talk about the full story, or sometimes they change it, like what happened in the Greatest Showman movie and other movies. I hope you answer my question. I love your show and your opinions about a lot of topics, and then some very cute emojis. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, 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 I hope I'm pronouncing your uh, username correctly, Magid Mahood. But great question. All right, so here's the thing: Hollywood only only cares about the sale, and unfortunately, they don't have any feeling of responsibility that they're you know, making people feel that this is the truth. I think they always say, well, based on a true story, or like, we never said this was 100% accurate. And it's like, you know what, come on. You know that people are gonna walk away and be like, I've learned something about this real character situation. And in reality, they often learn incorrect things. Now, Hollywood has always fudged things a little, because for instance, how are you gonna know what happens behind closed doors, right? To some degree, you do have to guess a little bit, especially when you're dealing with much older characters when there's not as much, you know, recordings and film on them, right? Like. P.T. Barnum. There's a lot known about P.T. Barnum, though, which The Greatest Showman just pushed aside. But for a very long time, based on a true story, he's been a great selling point. So Hollywood loves it. And I think that's one of the reasons they decided to do that element for The Greatest Showman, although we all agree that they don't need it, especially because it could not be further from the truth about P.T. Barnum, not only down to ignoring uh, the horrible, heinous things that he did, but it's actually factually incorrect about even the timeline of his life and career. Uh, and the individuals that he knew. It's just total, it's just like, I'd say 90% untrue. And also a lot of those elements I think they felt were not audience friendly. So, you know, they cherry picked, you know, they basically just wanted the name and that really did backfire on them. So hopefully this will discourage people from doing that in the future. But there are two television shows that I feel are even more egregious because they even, I mean, The Greatest Showman is clearly a fantasy. It's a musical fantasy. But these two shows present themselves as being highly factual when in fact, they are not. For instance, Manhunt Unabomber, I started to watch it, I loved it. I loved it so much, I, and as many of you, I've seen some of you say the same thing on Twitter. When you love these shows, you start to do your own research while you're watching them, right? So I was like, oh, I want to learn more about this. And I discovered that actually the lead, one of the lead investigators um, on that case was a woman, and it's not anywhere in the show. And that was very frustrating to me. So I stopped watching it, actually. I was like, I don't want to watch lies, this is just fiction. And then with the assassination of Gianni Versace, which is wonderfully done, just started this week, 
it's also really, really untrue. Now, some things are true, like uh, the shooting, like the dove that was also shot, uh, and also you know the, the, the situation with the blood on the steps. I don't want to give it away if you haven't if you haven't watched it. Uh, but a lot of stuff is made up. For instance, Andrew and Gianni Versace never went on a date. And then even at the club where they first meet, Versace picked up Andrew. He approached him instead of vice versa. And that's a huge change. Not only is it a huge change to the story, but I see no reason to reverse it. I don't know why this, the, the show would decide to do the alternative, right? Uh, I mean, it's not like, oh, well, it was harder to connect the dots or something like that. It, they're, they're pushing a narrative that suits them, but it's not the truth. So I think that that's horrible. I really have a problem with that. And I'm debating as to whether or not to continue with that show. It's so good, but I'm at the same time, I'm like, but it's, it's not true. Or it's like 50% not true. And that's a big percentage for me. I could maybe get away with 10 to 20% not true. Uh, or exaggerated if we want to like feel better about ourselves and the show that we're watching. But I think the new wrinkle is that audiences can fact check better than ever before. I mean, you know, before, you know, Wikipedia and all and articles and, you know, a lot today, a lot of publications will fact check these shows for you. Uh, no, everyone just had to take it at face value. And so Hollywood, you know, wasn't, you know, they weren't being called on their, their, their fictionalization as much. They're still not really being called on it, to be, to be fair. And I think that's a shame. I, I, but I, and I think they're getting worse because of it. Uh, the Crown is a good mix, though. I think The Crown is an excellent mix. I, I wouldn't take it as gospel on Netflix, but I think it's pretty darn close. So I would say when you watch these shows and these movies about real people, always do your own research and make sure you know what the reality of the situation is. Uh, and also, hopefully, this trend will not continue. I mean, it's, the only way it won't continue, though, is if people call the shows on it and stop watching them. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. So I'm curious, though, what is your thoughts on this? Do you think it's really important to get the facts right? Do you think Hollywood does have a responsibility? And when you watch these shows, does it make a difference to you how much is exaggerated? What percentage are you willing to accept? Again, I said I'd go with 10 to 20. What are you willing to, to, go, to go with? All right, write your thoughts down below. Thank you so much for your question, Majid Mahood. And also, everybody let me know what you'd like to see covered on Monday and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.